So if you've not been here any weeks, let me kind of, kind of give you a general statement that I didn't do the first three weeks. Uh, here's the goal of this series. By the way, it was what you asked for at our Easter survey. It was the number three most requested topic you asked for was tell me about the Holy Spirit. So you're asking for it, that's why we're giving it to you. Uh, but also the second reason why is I'm convinced that many of you in this room, you're heaven bound, but you're living in hell. You're heaven bound, you, you've done things over the last few years that weren't spirit led. You didn't pray about it, you didn't worship about it, you didn't, give, you didn't go accountability about it, you didn't ask for uh, those that authority to seek approval on that, you just kinda willy nilly your way through whatever that thing is. And I think today, if I could tell you anything, I would tell you this. God wants to be involved in every area of your life. Every family decision you make, every business decision you make, every resource decision, every purchase decision you make. And for many of you in this room, um, you're not being spirit-led in the decisions that you're making. And it has resulted in where you're at today. It's resulted in some situations where you go, woulda, coulda, shoulda. And today what I want you to understand is the Holy Spirit wants to come in and fill up every area of your life. Every area of your life the Holy Spirit wants to be involved in. And, and so I wanna start out a little bit different. I just wanna make this statement. And I think this is important for all of us to know today. We seek God because we need God. Like that's the, like that's the theological statement of the day right now. The reason why we talk about the Holy Spirit is because we don't know him. The reason why we talk about God is because we don't fully know him. The reason why we talk to God is because there's more he's revealing to us. So we seek somebody who can get involved in our todays. Zechariah 4, 6 says this. This is a Old Testament prophecy about a New Testament occurrence. And here's what Zechariah said. This is the word of the Lord. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. That word spirit is the word ruach. And actually, it isn't even translated. We said week one, it's best translated word, I'm sorry, a breath or wind. It actually isn't. It's actually best translated this way. There is no word to describe who the Holy Spirit is. So it, we said this, it would be father, son, wind, father, son, breath, but really what it would be, it would be father, son, He's this unseen force that wants to be involved in every area of your life. It's this wind. You don't see the wind, but you feel the wind. You feel the effects of the wind. Not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's ruach, it's the breath of God, it's the unseen force. But why we're talking about this, especially for some of you that grew up very theological and you grew up in the church and you grew up like that. Here's what I've found. And I'm just throwing the scripture up there for those of you that like, like to just sit around and talk about things of God instead of doing anything with God. This verse is for you. Here you go. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20. For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talking, well, let me debate this, and 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 let's talk about this, and well, I believe this, and you believe that. No, 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 that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not a lot of talking. It's living by God's dunamis power. We said week number one, the word power means dunamis, and it means supernatural ability and strength. There's something that you do not possess in this life that you need to possess so that you can be all that God wants you to be. It's a person. He's the Holy Spirit. And today I want to talk to you if you need to title the message, to, you can title the message Spirit-Filled Life. How do I live a Spirit-Filled Life? In fact, the very last words that Jesus spoke before he left this planet and how many know how something ends matters? How a movie ends matters? How a series ends matters? How, how life ends matters? How you end matters? In the last, the very, la the very last statement, like the last thing that Jesus said walking this planet, and you know the verse, you just don't know it as the last statement. But the very last thing that Jesus said walking this planet is Acts chapter one, verse eight. You know the verse. And it's this. He says, but you will receive dunamis power when the Holy Spirit gets involved in your life. That there is a power that you do not have. You're living in hell. 
heaven bound but living in hell, but there is a power that you need to receive so that you can live and you can be what the Bible says in the Sermon on the Mount to bring heaven to earth. That's the goal, that's the mission, that's the plan. So let me unpack our opening scripture that we've led with over the last uh, few weeks. 28 years after Pentecost, there's this massive church planning movement. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has happened. Many have received the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit as himself. But there's a lot of Christian interpretation of this passage of scripture that gets out of whack a lot of times. And it's our opening scripture, and I waited intentionally to the last week to unpack it for you so that you know. Acts chapter 19, the Bible says this. We've read it every week. I'm gonna read it out of the New King James today. And it happened while Apollos was in Corinth, so Apollos is in Corinth, and Paul, he passed through the upper regions, he comes to Ephesus, and finding some, what's that word, finding some, some what? Come on, read the word with me, some what? So uh, Apollos, find some disciples. Paul finds some disciples, and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, it's important for you to know that these men were good men, but they were disciples of John the Baptist. They were not yet disciples of resurrected Jesus. They believed in the Messiah, but they were still waiting for the Messiah to come. In the chapter before, there were two people, and they come to Apollos, and they explain that Jesus has already died, and Jesus has already resurrected. But at this point, they only knew Jesus as Messiah, but not about his death and not about his resurrection. So Apollos comes and he says, no, listen to me. I want to talk to you about not Messiah Jesus. I want to talk to you about resurrected Jesus. I want to talk to you about a power and a presence of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. So there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of uncertainty and controversy around this whole topic of what it means to be spirit-filled and what it means to live a spirit-filled life. In fact, there's churches that have divided over this topic. There's been church splits over this topic. And I just wanna give you my belief at the very beginning so you understand where I'm going over the next few moments, and that is simply this. I would rather worship the giver of the gifts rather than the gifts. The giver of the gifts over the gifts, the giver of the gifts. Because if I get the giver of the gifts, I will automatically get the gifts. But if I get the gifts, maybe I'll never see the giver of the gifts. So what does it mean to live a spirit-filled life? The greatest way that I can tell you a person is spirit-filled, in fact, let me just tell this to you, and I'll leave it very general. Um, We had a friend that just went out on a date. She was going on a date, she's single, and she was going out on a date, and, April said, I think you need to ask her to ask these certain questions. And this is what I said to her. I don't need to know his response to questions being asked to him. I need to know what he says when questions aren't being asked to him. I need to know if Jesus comes up. I need to know if church comes up. I need to know if it comes up without being prompted for them to come. Hey, hey, I want you to know, hey, last week I was in church and the pastor was preaching. Or, hey, last week I was in the word of God and when I was in the word of God, God said, listen for those things because when you listen for those things, you'll know if that person's been with Jesus. They've been with the giver. They've been with the person. I don't need a rehearsed answer on whether you've been with Jesus. I'll know that you've been with the giver of the gifts by just spending five minutes with you. I can tell in five minutes if somebody is spirit-filled and if they're actually living on fire for Jesus. Because at some point in the first five minutes, they'll tell me about the word that they were listening to, the worship song, the scripture they were in, the devotion, the sermon, the podcast, and they'll tell me something. I don't need to rehearse that, that, that they got a blessing from God. I need to know, did they actually meet the giver of the gifts? Are you hearing me? Yes. So the Bible tells us the greatest fruit of whether somebody's been spirit-filled is this. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And you know it. It's, it's eight of them. And by the way, it's, it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. It's not fruits. It's one. It's the fruit. You know what that tells me? If you're not doing one, you don't get them all. Fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit Just like this isn't Wellsprings Community Church. (laughs) Preaching to somebody right there. It's not Wellsprings? No, it's Wellspring. Ah, I know, I know for some of you, yeah, yeah. So this is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, 
joy, peace, gentleness, patience, goodness, kindness, and self-control. This is the greatest evidence of, well, of whether somebody is spirit-filled. It's the greatest evidence. Are, are, is that person joyful? Are they peace-filled? Are they kind? Do they not make rash decisions? Do they not get angry? Do they not yell? Are they good to people? Is their natural response not to gossip? Are they patient when something doesn't go their way? Are they gentle when something doesn't happen? Are they loving with every people, whether they look like them or act like them or believe like them? This is the evidence of a spirit-filled life. So the question is this. How do we live a spirit-filled life or a life that is spirit-filled? What does a spirit-filled life look like? What does it look like? What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, Ephesians chapter four tells us. And listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says this, don't grieve God. So let me say this to you. My greatest goal for you over the next few moments is this, that at the end of this message, we're gonna pray a prayer of infilling. You're gonna pray that. You're gonna, be, you're gonna pray the, uh, what's called an, I pray this every single day, it's an infilling prayer. And I open up my hands, and I get in a calm, quiet place, and I pray this prayer. And my prayer is that you will get past your doctrinal beliefs, your theological background, some sort of center tradition, that you would have your hands open and say this, God, if there's more, I want more. If there's more, I want more. If there's not more, then he won't put more in there. But if there's more, God, I don't want to have my hands closed that, you don't, that, I, that, I, that you're bouncing off more of you that I don't have a, a receptacle to be able to receive more of you. That's my prayer. So why I say that is don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve God. Don't grieve him. Every good James says this, every good and pleasing gift comes down from the Father of lights. So if he has the gift for you, why not receive the gifts that he has for you? Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit is moving and breathing in you. What other gifts do you have for me? You want me to do something else? Do you have something inside of me that you want me to do? Is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. I believe that many of you in this room, you've opened the gift of salvation, but you've never opened the gift of the Holy Spirit. You've never opened him. You've never invited him into your life. And I, 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 I promised myself I wouldn't go into a lot of detail of this because I don't want this to be on you. I just want you to know. I've shared this with you before. That's why when April and I make purchases, we wait 30 days if it's over $1,000 in our home. Why? Why do we do that? Because I just want to invite the Holy Spirit over the next 30 days. We're actually in the middle of a 30-day season right now on something that we want to do, we want to purchase, and we're waiting. And God's doing stuff inside of our heart, and we're trying to figure out, is now the right time to do this? Why? Because I want to invite the Holy Spirit in every decision. Where, what we do as a church, where we lead the church, how we lead our family, our schooling of our kids. What are we doing? What curriculum are you going to use? Everything we do in our life is, Holy Spirit, what do you have to say about this? What does it look like for you? What do you want to do? I know you're breathing in me and you're moving in me. What is it? What does it mean to be led by the gift of the Holy Spirit? It means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter five, here's a famous verse. And let me just, let me zero in for just a moment on this. Ephesians chapter five, you good? Everybody with me today? Feeling good? Good. Ephesians chapter five, the Bible says, you better be careful how you live. Don't be an idiot, don't be stupid, don't be a fool, don't be a dummy, don't be a moron. Any other analogies? Per, proper analogies, not four letter word analogies, all right? Don't be an idiot, don't be dumb. But like those who are wise, live like that. Make wise decisions, it's leading us somewhere. Make wise decisions, take every opportunity in these evil days. We are living in evil days, church. What happened in Lewiston, Maine this past week is evil. It's demonic. It's awful. For somebody to walk into a place and shoot up the place, it is only by the power of the devil that somebody can do that. These times are evil. These times are awful. What is happening in Israel and Palestine and the Gaza Strip, it's evil. It's awful. It's terrible. But it is setting us up for the return of Jesus. And by the way, 40 days after Jesus left this place, 40 days after his resurrection, he was standing on the Mount of Olives. I've been there. 
By the way, if you, if you look at a picture of Mount of Olives, where's the Mount of Olives? If you look at a picture on the internet, you'll see the golden dome. And when you see the gold dome, most likely that picture was taken from the Mount of Olives. Underneath the Mount of Olives is a garden of Gethsemane. Jesus stood up there. He did, theologically, this is the big word. He, he, it was the great ascension up into heaven. And the Bible says that Jesus will return in the very place that he left. He's coming back. And he's gonna come back, and let me just say this to you, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't act stupid. Don't act like a moron. But then it says, don't be drunk with wine. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, no. Because that will ruin your life. Instead, what? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Say this with me, don't be drunk. Come on, say it with me, don't be drunk. Say this with me, be filled. Don't be drunk, be filled. It's interesting that the first Jews, when they received the Holy Spirit, the people around them thought that they were drunk. Why is that? Because when you are drunk, you are under the influence. Now don't get hung up on the drinking thing, okay? Take a deep breath today. (laughs) But normally what most preachers do, they'll say something like this. You could fill anything in with drinking and it would be the thing. Anything, put anything you want in there. And it's true. But the Bible doesn't put anything in there. The Bible puts drinking in there. Uh, Drunk, being drunk in there. Does, Does it not? The Bible does. So there's something specific that the Bible's trying to tell us that when people are under the influence of alcohol, they act differently, they speak differently, they think differently, they do differently. If you're in this room and you're a cop, if you're in this room and you're in law enforcement, you've seen a lot of this. People are under a bad influence, a bad substance. The world gives us a counterfeit to a good Holy Spirit. And so although the Bible says don't be drunk with wine, and it is true, that's why, and I'll be honest with you, that's why April and I do not drink at all. We don't drink anything. I drink no alcohol. Because I know me, I have an addicted personality, and one glass will lead to two glasses, to lead a whole bottle, to lead every night, and at some point I will be drunk on that rather than be drunk on the Holy Spirit. I know me, I know me. So the question is, what are you drunk on that's not the Holy Spirit? Oh. What is influencing you that is taking the place of the Holy Spirit in your life? Let me say it this way, what are you being filled with that does not have room for the Holy Spirit to get in on that. If I had an illustration, I wanted to do this, but I thought about it this morning and it was the last minute, I would have a jug up here and I was gonna pour in, so picture this, okay? I was gonna pour in water. Okay, that's, that's sports and that's work. And what happens is that container gets so big and then you have a situation happen, a death in the family or a failure here, or a screw up here, and then you try to pour the Holy Spirit in and what happens? There's no room in the conveyor. There's nothing room in the, in, the, in the thing to fill up because you're so full on other things. What is influencing you? What is it that's influencing you? What is the thing that is causing you to not have access to be filled with the Holy Spirit? So one of the big debates around the church for years has been, um, do you get all the Holy Spirit when you get baptized? I'm sorry, when you get saved. Do you get all the Holy Spirit when you get saved? And I actually think that's a poor question. I actually think it's a very immature question. I, I think it's a very, try to, it's almost like we say going to heaven's like a get out of hell ticket. If your question is, do I say, am I gonna go to heaven? You're, you're still immature. A, a person, that no, person that is being filled spiritually doesn't ever ask, do, do, you, get, do you get all the Holy Spirit at, at salvation? A person who wants to be spirit-filled asks questions like, what does the Holy Spirit say about this? 
Hey, what, what, does it mean to, what does it mean to actually walk out this situation even though it's bad? What, what does it mean to invite God into this soul? What does it mean? How, what does the Holy Spirit have to say about this? What does it mean to live like this way? Hey, what does the Holy Spirit, that, that, that's how I know somebody's been filled with the Holy Spirit. So whether you get all the Holy Spirit and it's a one time or 10 times or 20 times or 30 times or 1,080 times or 3,072 times or 18,342 times, 0.73 or a million times, it doesn't matter. The question is not, do you get all the Holy Spirit? The question is, are you actively being filled with the Holy Spirit every single day? That's the ultimate question. That's the question. Is he involved in every area of your life? Because here's what happens, especially where I grew up in the the traditional Baptist, they would ask that question, do you get all the Holy Spirit? And and I would say to them, yeah, you do. Good, all right, I'm good to go. It's the wrong response. Or, Or the opposite, do you get all the Holy Spirit? No, you don't. Oh dear God, oh dear God, oh dear God, oh dear God. They're both wrong responses. The question I have is this, do you get all the Spirit? It's it's, receiving the Holy Spirit is an event and a journey. It's an event that happens at salvation and it's a journey of sanctification every single day. It's waking up and going, Holy Spirit, I need more of you. Holy Spirit, fill me up. Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, I can't do this on my own. Holy Spirit, should I do this? Holy Spirit, is this the right decision? Holy Spirit, and then, and you don't need, sometimes he'll speak in a half a second and sometimes you'll need to wait 30 days. You needing to wait the 30 days will determine whether you actually are filled up with the Holy Spirit. It's awful quiet up in this church. (laughs) Can I say this to somebody? Some of y'all need to take another drink. Don't take this 30 seconds and put it on social media. That'd be really bad. <laughs> but some of y'all, you ain't drunk enough. It's time to drink more. It's time for you to get drunk. It's time for you to get so drunk off the Holy Spirit that you act differently, that you think differently, that you speak differently, that you respond differently, that you are so controlled by the influence of the Holy Spirit that you don't even ask questions like, should I drink, should I smoke, should I cheat, should I? You don't even ask questions like that because all you're focusing on is being so actively connected to the Holy Spirit. Those questions are what un, un, immature Christians ask. Mature Christians are just so enthralled with being led by the Holy Spirit, we don't even answer those questions. Are you hearing me? What I'm trying to tell you is we've been, we have distorted the conversation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit by asking the wrong question. The question is not do you get all the Holy Spirit? The question is are you being filled every single day and you have access and control to him? So what do you do if you're not? What do you do if you're honest with yourself like I've been honest with you? I have an addictive personality. I have OCPD, just got diagnosed three months ago with OCPD. Get you some of that. Obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm obsessed about everything. What what time I'm gonna get home, this, the chair's not being straight, the card's not being straight. Everything in my life, I'm obsessed about everything. Everything. I prayed over it, I have a people pray over me. I think it's probably my lot in life, but the point I'm trying to make to you is this. If I'm not careful, I will allow the things other than the Holy Spirit to control me when God has designed me to only be in love with one thing, and that is allowing the Holy Spirit to lead me in every area of my life. So and why I say that to you is you're like, well, I just, I just, I just, I just, I just, I just, it's what happened, it's how I grew up, it was just culture, it's just this, it's just this. At some point, you're gonna have to ask yourself, who is in the chart, who is in the driver's seat of your life? Who is it? Okay, I gotta keep rolling. I gotta end this time. Okay, so when you are drunk, you are under the influence. So if you wanna be filled with the Holy Spirit, what do we do? What is the first thing we must do? Write these down if you're taking notes. Let me give you four of them. And then I'm gonna end by giving you an opportunity to pray an infilling prayer. I pray it every day. I would encourage you to pray it every day. You can change it up. It's my prayer. But first thing you're gonna have to do is to remove your barriers. You're gonna have to know today that God has more spiritual steps for you've not arrived. Can I tell you the scariest thing for me is when people wanna pour into other people but they don't wanna be poured into themselves. That's, get me away from that person. People that don't wanna be underneath authority, don't wanna have accountability, don't, they wanna actually help everybody else have their life better but they're not willing to go to anybody else and say, hey, what do you see in my life that's not supposed to be there? Oh, I'm, I'm done with that. You've lost me. 
God has more steps for you. You're gonna have to get past your doctrinal hangups. You're gonna have to get past your sin, your tradition, your background. You're gonna have to go study the Holy Spirit for yourself. What if I don't? Do I still get to go to heaven? Absolutely. But you'll live like hell on planet Earth. Can I just tell you, the only reason why we need the Holy Spirit is here on Earth. When we get to heaven, there's no need for him to be infilled inside of us because we're in a perfect environment. But if you don't have him here, oh my God, life's gonna suck. It's gonna be bad. Put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> what am I saying to you today? We tend to, we tend to avoid what we are afraid of or what we do not understand. I cannot explain to you what happened to me in 2014, standing on a stage in Haiti, watching somebody preach, not preaching, not leading worship, with my hands lifted, and I am singing in English, and after the first few stanzas, words are coming out of my mouth are not English. They're of some other language. And I had an out-of-body experience going, what in the world is coming out of my mouth? This isn't Baptist Joey anymore. What is going on? I don't understand this. I can't figure it out. But what I can tell you, the Christian I was in 2013 compared to the Christian I am in, was after 2014 is totally different. And the reason why is because I needed to not be afraid of the things I wanted to avoid and the things I did not understand. I went into this mission trip to Haiti going, God, if there's more of you, I'll take more of you. I went into church today going, God, if there's more of you, give me more of you. When you pray the infilling prayer in just a few moments, I'm praying to ride along with you. Are you hearing me? You gotta get past your barriers. Whatever it is that's causing you to go, no, 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 I don't know if I wanna do that, no, 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 no. Number two is this, this is a big one is you must understand that he has more for you. So ask God for all that he has for you. I, I wrote it down this way in my notes. All that I have is not all that he has. Let me say it this way, let me say it again, listen to me. All that I currently possess is not all that he has. In essence, he has more than I have. So if he has more than I have, and if he's a good father that wants to give to his kids, if he's got more for me, then I want it. Are you hearing me? I don't have patience, which means I lack at being a fruit of the spirit Christian. So over the last three years, that's been my greatest prayer in my prayer closet. Father, give me patience, patience. Give me gentleness and patience gentleness and patience. Let me be gentle with people. Let me not chew them up one that side and down the other. Let me be gentle and patient with people. Gentle and patient. I want to be gentle and patient. Why? Because I know that I'm not arrived. I was not gentle or patient. Some people would say I'm still not. I'm trying to be. So I know that he's got more gentleness and patience for me. Ask him for it. Ask them for it. Luke 11 says this, love this. He says this, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? What am I telling you today? There's more he has for you. There's more of him. There's more of his control. There's more of his yielding. There's more of his power. You're not asking for more of a person, you're more asking for of, of, of more of his power in your life. You have access to, the door is locked. You need to ask God to unlock the door of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's been locked. It's locked you up. There's more for you. There's more for you. There's more for you. Number three is you must understand it's gonna happen by faith. I'm using the word religion loosely, so forgive me. But it's very clear that this religion of Christianity is built off of faith. You've not seen Jesus. You've never seen the Holy Spirit. You've, you've never seen, you didn't see the nails in his hands. You didn't see him resurrected. You didn't see it all. What does it require? It requires faith. I have teenagers that come up to me all the time and they want all these questions like, who created God? Nobody created God. Well, if nobody prayed to God, then how did he show up? It takes, listen to me, it takes faith. There are just some things that we just need to receive by faith, by faith. 
Remember when your kids were on, younger? They didn't ever question how those presents got there. Well, how'd Santa Claus get down the chimney? And da 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 da. And he's fat. And the cookies did a. They just knew Christmas morning. Dear God, there's presents here. How did he get to every house? It's faith like a child. Faith like a child. Yield to him every day. I love this verse. I wish I had time to unpack this verse. But Ezekiel chapter 47, another prophecy about the New Testament. He said this, measuring as he went. Somebody go study this on their own. It's fantastic. He took me along the streams for 1,750 feet, and then he led me across the waters, and it was up to my ankles. That's salvation. That's the get out of hell ticket. That's heaven bound. It's up to your ankles. Which tells me this, there's more. There's more water. By the way, water represents the Holy Spirit. There's more. There's more. It's only the bankos. He measured off another 1,750 feet and he led me across it again. This time the water was up to my knees. It's up to my knees. That's serving. That's understanding scripture. That's understanding the Bible. That's understanding who you are in Christ. It's understanding your identity. It's, it's getting some, some, some training wheels on this thing called faith. After another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. Now listen to me. When that water gets up to your waist, you realize, I'm not trying to dance on this stage, okay? But you realize something else is controlling you. I'm moving a little bit and I realize that I'm just not, I don't have what I had a little bit ago when it was up to my ankles, but it's, it's moving me a little bit and you're being controlled by something that is not in you. And listen to how it ends. Then he measured another 1,750 feet and the river, it was too high to walk across. I am in the water, completely going wherever the water takes me and it was too deep enough to swim in but too deep, too deep to walk in. I'm just moving and grooving to wherever the Holy Spirit leads me. I'll go this way, he leads me. I'll go this way, he leads me. And some of you today, you're ankle Christians. Some of you are knee Christians. Some of you know, you're like, oh, there's, I go, oh gosh, he's, oh, there he is, oh, there, oh. And you got some waste action. Some of you are all in on this Holy Spirit thing. Here's what I'm asking you, take a step. And if you're an ankle Christian, come on, start serving. Come on, get that green shirt, rock some babies. Hey, waste, just, just worship. Speak it. Get your Bible. And here's the fourth one. Is to let him control you daily. If, if, I, if I could have done it, all that would have fit up here, I would have said let him control you every minute. I mean, every second, every minute, every 30 minutes, every hour, three times in the morning, three times in the afternoon. I'm saying somebody's peace schedule right now, aren't I? daily, every other day. Are you, are you getting the point, right? Like it's not a daily thing, it's a moment by moment thing. I could be spirit led in this one moment and then walk out of the room and totally not be spirit led in this other moment. It's every environment. One thing I've learned is I've learned to take what the pause app has helped me, but I've learned to take a pause from one moment to the next because I'm in this meeting and I'm spirit led in this meeting and then I get in my truck and I gotta go take care of something in my family and if I'm not careful, I won't take what, had, what the Holy Spirit had me in here and take it into here. So I need to pause before I start driving my car. Holy Spirit, I invite you into this car. Lead the conversation, lead your presence, maybe maybe whole and healthy and healing. And everybody that comes into this truck, I need you today. This is your truck, guide and direct in Jesus' name, amen. I've set my mind on what it means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit while I drive my truck. It's every moment. Now don't be a kooky weirdo and say it out loud, okay? It's a little weird and creepy, sort of. Last verse, and then I'll throw the prayer up here. May. May the grace of the Lord, we see the trinity, trinity in this one verse, trinity in this one verse. May the grace of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and the love of God, there's the Father and Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It's not enough just to have God. It's not enough just to have the Holy Spirit, I mean, Jesus, but you need the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. He's not weird. He's your friend. And he wants nothing more than to be with you. So I'm gonna throw this prayer up here. It's gonna be on the side screens. 
And I just wanted to be quiet for a minute or two. Now, the Bible does talk about something. We're not gonna, we don't, we don't need to bark in church. We don't need to like throw out modesty blankets that was gonna flop like a fish. Okay, okay. That's a manifestation. All we're gonna do is we're just gonna ask the Holy Spirit to fill us up. Now, the Bible does clearly say there's something about laying on of hands. And you may be sitting next to somebody that you know. What if you laid your hands on them and you pray this prayer over them? You join them. You said, would you pray this prayer over me? So here's the prayer I pray every single day. This is my prayer that I pray every single day. You can steal it or you can use your own. Here it is. Heavenly Father, I come to you recognizing that you are infinitely grace-filled and your love is boundless. You are the source of all things that are good. I thank you that every gift is pleasing to you. I thank you that you're the giver of the gift. And I plead with you, here's the key word, and I plead with you, here's the word, to activate. It's a key word, to activate. Would you activate within me the gifts of the Spirit? Tongues, interpretation, helps, poverty, missionary, shepherd, pastor, hospitality, exhortation, and I list them. Would you activate in me the gifts of you, the Holy Spirit, so that I can bear witness to people around me and ultimately bring you glory. Fill me up, Holy Spirit. Without you, I can do nothing. And with you, I can do everything. I need to be led by the dunamis power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the infilling of the Holy Spirit today. Come and be in me what I cannot be for myself. Every day. Every day. So I'm gonna let it be quiet for 60 seconds, 90 seconds. And I just want you to pray this. In fact, I wanna pray for you first. Father, right now, I pray for every single person who is seeking more of the Holy Spirit, seeking more of your presence, seeking more of who you are, seeking more of you and your agenda and your plan and your encouragement and who you have, you, Jesus, you, God, you, Holy Spirit. They want more of you. And so, Father, right now, I pray that these words wouldn't just be words on a screen, but these words would actually penetrate the hearts of your sons and daughters. It would be actually the words that would set this place on fire for the kingdom of God. Do your thing in the next few moments. Jesus, take your time and you pray that prayer. Father, I thank you for the ones that are in this room that felt the activation of the gifts. God, you revealed to them a gift. You revealed to them who you've called them to be. And I thank you right now that there's something afresh and anew that is happening in your sons and daughters. I thank you right now that there are men and women who are gonna stir up kingdoms for nations and regions. And I thank you for generations to come. The world is going to be different because of what you've done in the last few moments. I thank you for the realization of who you've called us to be. And I thank you for the filling of the Holy Spirit today, filling us up more of you and more of your power to trust you more deeply, to believe you more fully, and to obey you more clearly. God, that's what we ask. Do your way, do your will, have your way in our lives today. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, Won't you do me a favor? Would you stand all over this room? Here's what I want you to do I want you to respond. 
to whatever the Lord did inside of you. Our prayer team is going to be up here. And if you need prayer for anything, pray. Some of you need to go to that cross, these crosses right here, and some of you need to pin on there. Today, I make a commitment to involve the Holy Spirit in every decision I make. You should put it up there. It's a commitment you need to make. Some of you need to seal what God did by taking communion. Some of you need to light a candle for somebody in your room that loves Jesus. I believe there's somebody in your life that loves Jesus, but they're not being spirit-led. They don't know the Holy Spirit, although they know Jesus. Come light a candle for them so that the light of the Holy Spirit would invade their life. Whatever it is, you respond. You respond.